It's a joy to have acolytes, isn't it? What, what a blessing. I don't know when the last time was that you heard a sermon preached from the book of Numbers. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story that I'm about to read. Many of you have grown up in the church, and you might think that you have heard every passage of Scripture that there is, and that you know the stories frontwards and backwards. But I invite you to hear this gem that is in the middle of the book of Numbers. Numbers, that book that so many people skip over because they feel like it's the book that puts you to sleep. But let us hear from Numbers chapter 27. The daughters of Zilliphide, Hepfer's son, Gilead's grandson, Makur's great-grandson, and Manasseh's great-great-grandson, belonging to the clan of Manasseh and the son of Joseph, came forward. His daughters' names were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirzah. They stood before Moses, Eleazar, the priest, the chiefs, and the entire community at the entrance of the meeting tent and said, Our father died in the desert. He wasn't part of the community that gathered with Korah's community. He died for his own sins, but he had no sons. Why should our father's name be taken away from his clan because he didn't have a son? Give us property among our father's brothers. Moses brought their case before the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Zelophehad's daughters are right in what they are saying. By all means, give them property as an inheritance among their father's brothers. Hand over their father's inheritance to them. And speak to the Israelites and say, If a man dies and doesn't have a son, you must hand his inheritance over to his daughters. If he doesn't have a daughter, you will give his inheritance to his brothers. If he doesn't have any brothers, you should give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father had no brothers, you should give his inheritance to his nearest relative from his clan. He will take possession of it. This will be a regulation and a case law for the Israelites, as the Lord has commanded Moses. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, as I finish up this sermon series on I See You, we are going to talk today about the holy act of coming forward to right a wrong. The holy act of coming forward to right a wrong, whether it be in 14th century before Christ in Palestine or the 21st century right here. We're going to look at how God calls us to come forward to right a wrong. Now, I don't know if you followed all that I just read, all those hard-to-pronounce names of people in that list. But I want us to look a little bit at this biblical story. If you've been worshiping with me for any length of time, you know that I typically like to tell modern-day stories, modern-day parables like Ann did. But today, I want us to dig in to this biblical story because I don't think it's familiar to us, and yet I think it is so important for the day and time in which we live. The message that is here is one that I believe we need to live out. So here it is. This book of Numbers is in the First Testament, also known as the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament. The book gets its name because it contains two long lists of names from census that were taken of the men, the Israelite men, 
after they escaped from Egypt. If you remember, the Hebrew children had been slaves in Egypt, and God called Moses to come forth in the midst of that injustice and to tell Pharaoh that the people needed to be set free. And through a series of events, Moses does end up leading the people out of slavery, and they are headed towards the promised land. But as you recall, because of many different things that went on among the people, they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, at the beginning of their wilderness life, a census was taken so that they would know how many men they had who could fight in an army as they entered that new land and needed to conquer the people there. But after 40 years, that generation had died away. So now they stand on the precipice of entering this new land, and they need to take the census again. And they take the census for two reasons. One is they do need to find out how many men they have to assemble an army as they prepare to go into this new land for whatever battles they need to fight as they prepare to inhabit that land. But secondly... They want to take the census of the clans, the 12 sons. They want to take a census so that they can figure out how much land to give to each clan, each tribe, so that the large tribes will have a larger tract of land and the smaller tribes will have a smaller tract of land. Divide the parcels out so that there is equity, so that everyone has enough land to care for and to feed their families, that every family has an opportunity to thrive in that new land. So God gives Moses this plan on how to divide the land because God wants to make sure that everyone can thrive in this new land. But here's the thing. If you read through these long lists of the names of the people, like I just did. If you read through all of the chapter that comes right before this, chapter 26, where you have all of the names, you'll notice that this second census was very much like the first census in that all of the names are the names of men, except for five women who are listed here in the second census. Now, if you've read Scripture very often, you know that if women are named in the Scripture, you better pay attention because something important is about to happen. The Holy Scriptures don't often name the women. But here we have five women who are named in this census. So our ears perk up. Why are these five women named in this census? Well, the men have been named in the census for a reason. In order to divide the land out, the men were the heads of the tribes. And women at that time, were considered as not much more than property, like cows, pigs, things that belonged to the men. In very fundamental ways, the women were considered property of the men. It's interesting, isn't it? Even though the Israelites knew firsthand what it was like to be considered property, because that's what they were considered when they were slaves in Egypt, they were property of the Pharaoh. Even though they knew what it felt like to be considered property, they still used the power that they had to treat others as their property. As they laid out the rules for who would get how much land by their tribes, that system seemed to work pretty well for most clans until they get to this one family 
this one family where the father has died, leaving no sons to inherit the land, and all he leaves are five daughters. We don't know anything about what happened to the mother, but what we know from this scripture is that these five daughters were going to be left out of an inheritance of any land. As they entered that land of milk and honey, that promised land where God's love would reign, these five women would be destitute. They'd have no property on which to cultivate food for themselves. They would end up being penniless, homeless beggars in this new land. And yet we just heard that God's desire was that everyone be provided for and everyone be nourished in this new land. So what were they going to do? Nobody up to this point had even thought about how do we take care of persons in this system where only the men are allowed to own the land? How do we take care of persons if there's no man in that family to take care of them? So the women are faced with a predicament. What can they do? Now let me set the scene for you. Moses and Aaron, Eliezer, the chief, the Aaron's already dead at this point, sorry. Moses and Eliezer, the chief priest, the assembly of people are gathered together at the temple door, and they are hearing this list and dividing the land out among the different groups. And these women are bold enough to come and to state their claim as they hear this list and realize that they will not get an inheritance. Now, I want you to know how bold they had to be, how much faith and how much courage that took for them to do that. If you read through the book of Numbers, you read back in chapter 12, that Moses' sister Miriam had disagreed with him about something, telling him that he had not done something right, and she ends up developing leprosy. We read a little bit later in the book of Numbers that two men argue with Aaron and Moses that they think something they've done is not right. They quarrel with them over it, about one of their rulings. And the earth opens up and swallows these men alive. So this is not an easy thing to do. This is a serious thing to go to Moses and to say, Hey, Moses, you missed us. You got it wrong. Us women here, we need land too. Very intimidating. It's almost like some of us when the president is making a national speech on television and all the cameras are there and the Congress is in front of him and all of those people are there and we stand up, excuse me, Mr. President, you got that wrong. You forgot about everybody watching, everybody watching. These women are bold and they stand up. Now, the scriptures don't tell us why they did that, what gave them the courage to do that. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall the night before they went up to Moses and to the chief priest. I would have loved to have heard that conversation. Now, how are we going to do it? What are we going to say? How are we going to say it? Are you sure it's the right thing to do? Because, you know, we all have different ways of dealing with injustices in life, don't we? We see so much injustice in the world today. And how do we face it? We face it in a variety of different ways. Some fight, some flight, some hide, some pretend it will go away. Well, I want you to imagine with me what it might have been like for these five women that night before, just an imaginary conversation that I can picture them having. 
their responses might have been like this. The older sister might have understood the way that the world has always been and how difficult it is to make change. And she might have in her mind thought, it's going to be hard for my sisters anyway in this new land, being poor, without land, having to beg. There's no need for us to make waves and be labeled as troublemakers. So let's just be quiet and just go on into the land and make the best of it the best way that we can. But then there was probably another sister who said, well, you know, why don't we live into the system? If we need to have a man, let's just marry the first man that comes along. Then we'll have a man, and then we'll get land, and then, you know, we'll be able to provide for ourselves. Let's just go with the system. That's the way the system is. We'll go with the system. But then a third sister might have said, I can't do that. I mean, we've wandered around in this wilderness just like the men have. We're created in God's image just like the men are. This is not right. We need to fight. We need to stand up for our rights. And the more she got riled up and angry over it, you could just see the other sister, the pious one, go, now, now, calm down, honey. Just calm down a little bit. You know, God will take care of us. We just need to pray about it. And everything will be fine. Just pray about it, and everything will be fine. But then the other sister, she probably looked and listened to what her sisters had to say. And she said, you know, this is not right. It is not right for us to go into this land and not have land. We can't just live with the way things are because God wants all of us to prosper and to thrive. We know that's what God wants. And I tell you, it's not going to be right for us to just marry someone just to have land. That's not the way to do it either. I mean, maybe we ought to just go to Moses and tell him what's going on. Tell him it's not fair and that it's not just. Tell him that we want him to ask God to change the law, to change the way that they're dividing the land. She says, you know, unjust systems don't just fix themselves. And if we live within the system then we're not making it any better for generations that come after us. We know it's not right. Maybe God's calling us to fix it like God called Moses to lead the people out of slavery. Maybe God's calling us to do something about it right now. And yes, of course, we should pray. But God calls us to do more than just pray. God calls us to step out and to do what we can. Moses didn't just pray. He spoke up. He spoke to the powerful Pharaoh, and he took actions. Now, maybe those other sisters wanted to poo-poo the naivete of this sister, but somehow they all came together. They all came together, and maybe they realized that that last sister, the one who said, let's go and speak to Moses, was going to go on her own anyway, whether they went or not. And maybe they said, you know, if you're going to speak up, we're going to speak up with you. And then they can't get mad and punish just one voice. They'll have to punish the whole family. Families stick together. So in love, let's all of us go and speak to Pharaoh. 
I'm not sure that that's how that came about, but I do know they did all go, and they talked to Moses together. And my friends, that's what families do. When we see one person suffering injustice, we all speak together, we go together, we support one another in moving forward and speaking up for justice. When we were baptized in the waters, we were baptized into the family of God, meaning that we share each other's joys, but we also share in each other's pain, no matter how frightening that may be. Do you know what their father's name really means? You know, biblical names have meaning. Their father's name means protection from fear. Protection from fear. I believe that their father taught these girls not to be afraid. afraid. And that's what God tells all of us that God's perfect love will cast out fear. No matter what the consequences are, when we see injustices being done, out of love we need to speak up, to come forward as these daughters did, and to speak up and to speak out. When we see an oversight or an injustice impacting one voice, we are called to join our voices with that one and to speak up to not allow them to be a lone voice crying out in the wilderness. I know that because that's the message throughout all of Scripture, that we are all called to be together, and that God's desire is for all of us to thrive, for no one to be left out, for justice to reign. As the prophet Micah said, the Lord requires of us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. You know, we can't just read one passage of Scripture and cherry pick and pull that out. We have to read it from beginning to the end, all the way through. And all the way through, we understand that God wants all of us to thrive and belong. You know, there are 144 women named in the scriptures out of the 15,000 names in the Bible. And five of those are these daughters. They aren't priests. They aren't political leaders. They aren't chiefs. They are simply individuals that for centuries had been considered property without rights to a plot of land without rights of their own. And yet they are listed here in the Holy Scriptures. And I want you this afternoon to take time to look at their names. Look at their names. And remember, if you have ever felt overlooked, if you have ever felt unnoticed, uncared for, if you have ever felt like you don't belong, that you are not worthy that you don't have a claim to the beauty and the life of love and peace and joy that Jesus came to bring to us, I want you to see your name is written here in this holy book. You are named and claimed by a God who created you and desires for you to be blessed. So these women, they speak up with that voice, They speak up with that voice of inclusion to not be left out. And Proverbs chapter 31 verses 8 and 9 admonishes us to join their voice as it says, Speak out for those who cannot speak for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out and judge rightly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Woman is theologian Katie Cannon once noted, the sad truth is we are all created in the image of God with an inherent dignity and voice, but sin has crept into our systems and our structures and our cultures and our laws and robbed that voice from some while amplifying it for others. Amen? But there's hope. There's hope in the truth that we live in a world 
where there are voices that will join with ours and speak up. This church is a beautiful example of that. One of the hallmarks of this church is that this congregation stands up for social justice and works for justice to be done. This church is one of those church churches that understands that we have the capacity to shape our history, to join with these daughters and become part of a great story of transformation of this world to make it more just for people. Because I don't have to tell you that there are a lot of rules and laws and traditions in our world today present in our culture and in our churches and in our communities all around the world. And new laws and new rules and new regulations are being talked about and discussed and added to and amended and adapted all the time. And sometimes we find out that those rules and laws are inadvertently excluding others in unjust ways. But other times, it seems like those laws and those rules and those regulations are blatantly stripping rights and causing injustice to increase. Think about voting rights that are being considered or implemented in states in our nation. Consider our current systems of bringing in refugees and immigrants to our country and what regulations have been created that affect our climate and our environment. Think about laws that have been written around reproductive women's rights. Remember rules and standards that have been implemented that encourage disparity in benefits and pay between men and women. God is calling us, my friends, to a community that widens the circle, the circle of inclusion for all God's people. God is calling us to remember Micah 6 8, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. These daughters, these ancient daughters, understood that. So let me ask you, what will you do? Will you contact an elected leader? Will you vote? Will you remind others to be educated about the candidates before they enter the voting booth so they know for whom they cast their votes? Will you organize a community forum to bring together people to talk about the issues of injustice and what we can do together? What will you do? How will you come forward like these women? And how can we as a community of faith come forward together to transform this world? You know that is our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, that God's kingdom may come to earth as it is in heaven. May we each have the faith and the courage to so live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.